Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Ailey Cohen, host of the Smart Human Podcast, a podcast dedicated to all things environment, environmental health, integrative medicine, and disease prevention. Today, our guest is Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller, who is an obstetrician gynecologist, an integrative medicine specialist. Actually, that's where we met in training. And she's also a specialist in forest bathing. And for those of you who don't know what that is, forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku is immersing yourself in nature and the forest and all of the benefits. So today we'll speak to her and talk about everything from how she got into integrative medicine, how she transitioned into forest bathing, and her new book, The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing and all of her continued work and projects. I hope you enjoy our show today. (laughs) So today we have, as our guest, an old friend of mine. We'll talk about how we got to meet and how we got to know each other, Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller, who is a uh, specialist, I should say, in a very interesting topic um, called forest bathing. And she'll get into that in terms of the definition and and what that's all about. But first I wanna start with just a hello. And Suzanne, why don't you tell our audience how we got to know each other? Hello, Ailey. Well, I would love to. Um, Isn't it funny? It was 2012, so this was over eight years ago. Seems like yesterday. I mean, honestly. So we're not any older, though. No, no, no. Our ages go back in time, but right, right. But, but you know, oh my gosh. I mean, I will never forget the day that we met. So when I met you, it was the first day of our fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and I walked in late, probably an hour late. Because, and I sat down next to you. Did you? Remember you? That? I don't remember that. Yes. I remember you made an entrance because we were all looking to see who was sort of the people, the last people to yeah. walk through the door for the Yeah, entrance. I wanted yeah. to make a grand entrance, you know, make a big scene. Actually, I did not, but it worked out that way because I had spent the previous night, all day, in fact, the previous day, trying to get to Tucson from Iowa. And it's interesting because I wasn't even sure I was going to be there at all. I had really highly contemplating deferring for like the third time. I just kept deferring the fellowship uh, because my husband, Dave, at the time was sick with lung cancer, stage four lung cancer, and uh, not a smoker, but diagnosed with a form of lung cancer in 2008. And so when you and I met, it was 2012, um, January or February. I don't know, but, uh, it was February actually. I do know that. And so, um, I was going to defer, but then Dave said that I was not going to defer. He was going to go with me by this time. He was in hospice. If you can that or remember, um, and he was on oxygen. He was on six liters of home oxygen and, uh, it, it was definitely end stage. And I said, there's no way I'm going to Tucson and leaving you here because I was his primary caregiver. I was giving him right. his baby meds and everything. So he said, well, I'm going with you then. So I couldn't believe it. It was crazy. Um, everybody thought it was crazy, but his hospice nurses and social worker agreed to make it happen. So we got a a home oxygen concentrator and he literally weaned himself down from six liters of oxygen to two liters in order to be able to fly on a plane with a portable concentrator. So all things considered, it ended up being one of the most stressful moments of my life after taking oral boards. Um, because or words for your specialty of for my specialty in OBGYN. Uh, previously, that had been hands down the most stressful life experience I had had. But trying to fly on a plane with a portable oxen- oxygen co- concentrator uh, ended up being a disaster. So you had it came with battery packs. Of course, they didn't charge. We couldn't charge them. So we had a layover in Denver, wow. and we spent ten hours delaying each subsequent flight um, 
choosing to bump ourselves so that we could sit in the airport and try to charge this stupid thing so that we would have enough battery to make it to Tucson. It malfunctioned. We had problem after problem. And these are life-threatening situations. You yeah. Can't this, is, this is oxygen. This is what you yeah. breathe. Yeah. Right. So um, it ended up being just terrifyingly horrible. And finally, we decided we had to take the last flight out at 11 at night because otherwise the alternative was staying in a hotel and we would not have necessarily had better oxygen. I mean, better battery life. It was just an unbelievable debacle. So uh, my husband's daughter, my stepdaughter, Sarah had flown from Minneapolis to meet us there. So thankfully she got there to Tucson before we did got our rented oxygen concentrator set up. So we somehow, by the grace of God, got from Denver to Tucson, got on a shuttle that took us directly to the hotel. The, the uh, larger oxygen concentrator was set up and we were good to go. But we got there so late at night. I had been so monumentally stressed out the day before oh that gosh. I was not able to get up at the crack of dawn and get to class. So it was all I could do to take care of him the next morning, get all of his needs met get me ready and to class about an hour late. So yeah. And mind you, this is, this is an integrative medicine program where you're supposed to be zen and right. relax. Oh, I'm sure some yeah. of you had yoga that morning or Tai oh, Chi sure. because they had those lovely options every morning and an amazing spread of breakfast, which I missed out on. And so, yeah, I, I walked in, you know, in a, as a skeleton of a human being and sat down and of course, they made me introduce myself to the group because everybody else had done introductions by then. And uh, so I shared a little bit of that story. And I don't know, probably burst into tears. I honestly don't even remember. Um, but it, it was it was quite the mess. And that whole week was was life changing and transformative and wonderful being with so many like minded souls. But I really was only half there because right. I would have to run back to the room at every break and give him some IV meds or things like that, and then um, run back and miss the evening activities and things. And so I felt like I was only partly, you know, partially there and partially with him. And but we got through the week and it was a really special time. He had the opportunity to spend time while I was in class with his daughter. You know, that was a beautiful time for them. Um, he got to sit outside in the beautiful sun of Tucson instead of being home in Iowa winter in February. And we had some really special moments. Um, we managed to get back with a different concentrator completely uneventfully. Um, the, 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 the trip home was nothing compared to the trip out. Um, but he passed away three weeks after that, which, oh. you know, that's, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's hard to believe all of that actually happened. feels like a dream in many ways. But you know what that time spent, I mean, I met him, I was there. Um, and I mean, at the time you had at that, that kind of, um, transition in your life to be at this program, Mm -hmm. which, you know, is not easy to get into, is not something right. that everyone takes lightly. You have to invest right. time and money. Um, it has to be something that, you know, your heart leads you in that direction, right? Because yeah. you didn't just Definitely. apply the day before. I mean, you right. really, you had wanted this and yeah. here your husband was encouraging you to go and really supported you. And so right. I think that's a tribute to kind of that journey, right? Yeah, it is. You know, I actually applied in 2010 after I heard, Dr. Weil speak at a conference in Colorado in October of 2010. And right after that, I applied and I did defer for at least two different sessions before we started because of Dave's health. It was like, how could I possibly start this whole journey? And then, and it was really Dave who insisted that this was my next move, what I had to do. And essentially he had to make it happen. So very selfless. Yeah, no, I think that's actually a really wonderful memory, as stressful as it was, and, and we all knew it. I mean, we all saw it, you know, we, yeah. we witnessed it. Um, you know, it also showed, it was a testament to your desire to be there and, 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 and really want to dive into this. So, so tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what made you want to apply originally, I guess, and repetitively, I guess, and, you know, after hearing Dr. Weil, and then also, how do you think that that's put you in a position now with the work you're doing? Yeah. Well, gosh, I mean, it's, it's been such a journey. I, you know, people who knew me back in residency considered me one of the most conventionally minded physicians. You know, I, I wasn't really into any of the things that we 
recommend as integrative physicians now. It's comical, honestly, thinking back to the, the doctor and the person I was 20 years ago. Um, but, but yeah, life has a way of, of showing you what you need to know, um, and nudging you along. And I was very, very burned out as an OBGYN and primarily solo practice, uh, probably starting in about 2007 through about 2010 and 12. I mean, really, really struggling with, with primarily a, a solo most of the time, uh, practice with partners who would come and go, but just very, very busy. Um, I also have a son who has autism and, um, you know, people would tell me, you should try this thing. You should try this diet. You should try this test. You should try this treatment. And I felt like I was never going to experiment with my son on these things. And yet I had a glimmer of a sense that maybe there was something to some of these integrative modalities, these complementary and alternative approaches. Uh, and then of course, with my husband being diagnosed with lung cancer, it, it started asking. It started me asking uh, more and more questions about what we're doing in medicine, what we're doing environmentally. Like, what are the environmental exposures that contribute to a child with autism, whose mother is an obstetrician, who does everything during her pregnancy and breastfeeding, and all of those things that you're supposed to do to have a healthy child? Um, why does a, a young, healthy, vigorous guy develop lung cancer? Um, and what are the things that contributed to that that we don't have answers to? Or maybe some people have answers to, but I certainly didn't. And I had no idea where to find that information. Um, so both from a, why are these things happening? And then what can we do about them in, in, in ways that maybe we didn't learn about in medical school and maybe things that are more natural and supportive of, for example, a diagnosis of lung cancer that could help along this way. Of course, we did everything we could do. We did the chemotherapy. We did the um, targeted therapies that were available just in their earliest days. Uh, we did radiation and surgery and all the things that you would always do for somebody who's trying to fight cancer. But we also then, you know, at the very end, because of course that's when I was just starting to get into it, we tried to add the other things that are supportive and complementary and helpful. Right. Like so, integrative medicine by definition, which is right. something that didn't scare me off was integrating into a Western approach because pretty similar to the way, you know, you, you were, were kind of broaching into this, not certainly out of duress, but you know, the idea that we're trained in Western medicine, we're not given any really training in nutrition. I mean, I don't, right. you know, even now there's about five hours per four years of med school. I mean, a total of five hours of nutrition training um, for four years of, of, of you know, a medical yeah. school training. So, you know, we're, we're having problems even, even in modern day, but the idea that um, to, to add on to what already is established is less scary than to say, all right, let's just bag the meds and Absolutely. let's just go right into acupuncture. I mean, that's, right. that's a little bit of a jump for me and I'm sure right. maybe for you. Absolutely. Um, so now tell me, tell, take me into um, where you went from your training in integrative medicine and kind of um, walk us through sort of where you are in, in your current status of yeah. being super outdoor warrior woman. <laughs> Oh, well, again, life, the journey of life. So um, do you remember, so you and I would sit in the back of the room of our classroom because- We weren't in the front, Suzanne. I thought I'd be a nerd in the front. I know. We just aren't that student. No, no that's right. <laughs> we talked about it and laughed about it at that time, that we're just not front of the classroom people. And that doesn't- I think that doesn't that make us, us bad people. It doesn't make it us bad. Doesn't. It makes us very studious and learned people. But um, so I remember us sitting in the back of the room on our very, very last day. I think I will remember that day forever because it was so moving, so poignant, so exciting and invigorating to hear our professors talking to us about the future and how they were inviting us to just, you know, join, join them in this whole world of integrative medicine and to, to find our calling. And I, I've said this many times, but I remember sitting there while Victoria, Dr. Victoria Mazes, who's the executive director of the fellowship, I remember her saying that we will all find our niche. 
And I remember sitting there kind of in a panicky state, like, I don't have a niche. And I've told her this since then. Maybe I haven't told you this. Have I told you this? You know, I think we were all pretty much like deer in headlights at that point because we had this training, but we weren't exactly sure what to do next. Right. Although you always had kind of an environmental um, passion and you had some of that already brewing. I was just just getting into it actually during that time. Um, It was actually very early on. So I was just sort of not where where to jump in either. But you're right. It took footing sort of at the end of the training. Yeah. But I remember certain things that you didn't love so much. <laughs> I remember things that I didn't love so much. And so there were a few things that kind of seemed like they weren't necessarily our niche. But I remember thinking, I love nutrition. I love the mind-body stuff. I love the herbal medicine. I just, there were so many different things that I felt like all of them kind of seemed, they had a pull towards me, but they didn't really feel like it. Like I didn't see myself going out and becoming a nutritional expert by any means. And I, I, right. I really was fascinated by herbal medicine. At that time, I didn't know that I would end up studying it further. And I did end up doing two more years with Dr. Tarone Lodog, which was fantastic. And um, But at the time, I didn't think I would do that. I remember classmates doing that and thinking, oh, that's probably not for me. But we just didn't know what right. a niche would be. And I remember having a sense of a little bit of panic about that at the time, which is kind of funny because in life, your niche finds you. It's not the other way around. We don't get to choose. We don't get to know. We just are supposed to remain curious and see what unfolds. And I think that's probably well one said. of the biggest yeah. lessons along the way is just remain curious and see what happens. So that is what happened. And so I, um, you know, the first few months of the fellowship were really difficult because I was dealing with, with Dave's death and, uh, all of what came with that. And then ultimately got just poured into it. And we completed that in the, in January of 2014. And so then I'm off trying to figure out my niche in life, but, but, but not actively at that time I was practicing, um, only integrative medicine. Um, but I, I found myself drawn to being outdoors and mostly I, at first, um, my, my survival after Dave's death was running and I just, I started running and I never had really been a runner before, but that was what I felt like I needed to do. And I just ran and ran and ran and, uh, trained and ran, you know, races and things like that. And, um, and I got really into that and then I still felt like, oh, this isn't really for me and discovered mountain biking. And that was what really did it for me for that adventure aspect of things. And, um, started training and doing outdoor adventure triathlons that were trail running and mountain biking and kayaking. And for several years, that was my thing. And it, it, at first it seemed like it had to be, you know, the, the more challenging, the more physically demanding, the more, you know, risky, <laughs> the better. Um, right. but I, I was really called, uh, drawn towards the adrenaline rush, which interestingly is very much like people who have a career in obstetrics and gynecology tend to be, tend to be kind of adrenaline junkies, tend to be adventure seeking, tend to, I uh, did a test a sur- uh, questionnaire recently and discovered that I have high boredom susceptibility, which explains a lot about me. I should send you that, this questionnaire, you would probably find it very interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I gotta, you know, be careful. I don't get rid of my husband or get rid of my, my latest iteration of my career. I always worry about those tests. They tell too much. Yeah, anyway. tell me about it. This is a very interesting one though. It, it explained a lot about me. So, um, so I, at first that was it. I had to be outdoors doing some form of, of adventure. And then I somehow had a shift at some point and realized that you know, in life, we can't always be go, go, go. We can't be constantly pushing the limits of our adrenaline. Um, and realized that in order to balance, I really needed some of both. And I, I practiced yoga through all of this. And I, and thankfully, I think that really helped me to find this idea of balance. Um, but just, but started kind of discovering the quiet contemplative time in nature and realizing that there was really an important thing there too. And, uh, 
I guess it was about 2014. I, I first heard the t- term forest bathing and I was like, what in the heck is forest bathing? I mean, talk about woo woo. So, I mean, if, if we, if I haven't gone far enough yet from conventional doctor who only practices, you know, conventional medicine and surgery and prescribing pharmaceutical drugs to now a doctor who prescribes herbal medicine and talks about yoga and all of these other things and nutrition and are you taking your vitamin D? Should we check your levels? Um, Now suddenly I'm talking about forest bathing, but I thought I would explore it and experiment a little bit. And so in, I believe 2015 or 2016, I was doing a workshop series on integrative modalities at a local retreat center. And, uh, I squeezed in one of the workshops to be nature and medicine. And I also had spirituality and medicine and whole medical systems um, and community. And we did all these great things. We did um, Native American healing practices and did a sweat lodge and all this cool stuff. But the week that we did nature and medicine, I decided to explore this forest bathing idea really pretty cluelessly. I had a little handbook and some kind of tips on how to do it, but took these 20 people, they were all women, forest bathing at this workshop and they loved it. And absolutely it resonated with them. And they shared all of these experiences that happened with them during the experience. And then afterwards, the most amazing thing happened was that when they returned the following week for the next workshop in the series, they almost all of them said that they had gone out and done some version of forest bathing in the intervening week. And they were, they were just so moved by it and they had shared it with family members and things like that. So, so, so what did they experience? So tell us a little bit about the actual, like, what is, first of all, the first time I ever heard of, (laughs) the first time I ever heard of forest bathing was you. Okay. Because I had never heard of it. I'm like, what is Suzanne into? What's going on here? No, and then I really find good. out that you're like really into it. So tell tell the audience like a little bit about the details. Right. Yeah. So forest bathing. Yeah. Now I, it's, I'm always surprised to hear more and more that people have heard of forest bathing. Um, I, the, the term itself is a little off putting at first, unfortunately, because it implies really out there crazy you know, stuff. We do keep our clothes on. It's not a clothing optional time type of thing. Uh, but forest bathing is a translation literally, literally from the Japanese Shinin Yoku, which is a term that was coined in the early 1980s by a couple of doctors in Japan, doctors Lee and Miyazaki, who recognized that people in Tokyo, in the city, were completely stressed out, burned out, uh, very high incidence of mental health problems, depression and anxiety, and some of the highest suicide rates in the world. And so these doctors wondered if there would be some benefit to getting people out of the chaos of the city, out of the lights and the sounds and the constant technology and the crowding of people. <clears throat> and the noise so pollution. Yeah. What's that? I was going to say, and noise pollution Absolutely. and all the other senses that we don't often think about. Yeah. Right. Just, yeah, um, overload. So they wondered if taking them out into the forest would be of benefit to them both mentally and and hopefully maybe even physically. So they started taking people out into the woods about an hour outside of Tokyo and guiding them through a mindful practice of taking nature in through the senses. And their initial uh, forest bathing excursions would take a weekend. So they would be there for like three days and two nights. And of mm. course, um, that's not what they all are now. I I don't typically do that length of time with people. Um, but they also, interestingly, collected a lot of data on these people since way back in the 80s, looking at both questionnaires of their mental health, looking at things like depression and anxiety and, um, you know, just self-esteem and vigor and all of these things and found that time after time, the participants were reporting dramatic improvements in virtually all parameters of mental health. And of course they did some controls against like walking in the city and things like that. And so then they also started taking physical data. So they would test their blood pressure and their pulse. They would uh, look at their heart rate variability, which is a measure of how 
much sympathetic or stress tone you have in the body. <clears throat> they also would take cheek swabs of saliva um, to look at the enzymes amylase and to look at their cortisol levels, which are thought to be markers of stress in the body. So again, over the course of now several years and now several decades, they've taken all of this data to find that Time after time, they're finding that people do have both physical and mental health benefits from this practice. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because up until, you know, obviously COVID, I mean, we really, what could be more stressful of a time than COVID and all the other, I mean, big news stories? 2020 has not been uh, a really good year so far. Um, you know, the stress, the quarantining, um, home teaching of your kids, you know, being out of work, unemployment. I mean, so, you know, up until 2020, you would think that it was just a nice add on, you know, right. When you can fit in right. nature, you can fit in exercise, maybe a massage, you know, like yeah. those were extras. And yeah. now it seems as though it's a real lifeline to be, it's to be in nature, to be social distance, to have trees as your closest social contact. Right. Um, tell me how you think this fits in, especially now. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? I, you know, I started writing about this. I wrote a few blogs about this way back, even as early as February, about how you know the coronavirus is coming and we should get outdoors as one of our best ways of dealing with it mentally and also physically, um, you know, for, and I'll do a little, make a little aside here. Um, we actually know that there are chemicals found in plants and trees called phytoncides that help us to fight infection, help us to fight bacterial and fungal and viral infections and to help to reduce inflammation. They also have even been found to boost our natural killer or NK cells and help us to fight tumors. So, I mean, if you even just think about that benefit from being out in nature, that's that's just- So from an inhaling, yeah. are you talking about from inhaling those right? yeah. yeah. chemicals inhaling. and compounds? Wow. wow. So when, if you're smelling the, you know, the fragrance of a pine tree, for example, I mean, you're inhaling those volatile oils that contain these phytoncides and they work- Did they to put help. those into those little pine trees you hang yeah. in your car- window or am I completely wrong about that? Those are really I synthetic. Like pine trees from the, you know, the little um, car. Car washes that you pick yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. But, I don't know about those, but you know, essential oils of, of some of these, especially coniferous evergreen trees do confer some of that benefit of being able to inhale those phytoncides. And they've even done some of the work, some of that work in Japan using Hinoki cypress, which is one of their predominant trees in the forest and using the essential oils in the home of the Hinoki cypress. So, I mean, it, it's kind of mind boggling, honestly, but so back to your question about COVID, I mean, <clears throat> We do need to be outside. And what I'm seeing as somebody who spends a lot of time outdoors, you know, my husband, um, I'm remarried. I should maybe mention that to those who are wondering. Um, so and my husband, guys, Joe, and, and you, I, I was going to say, you guys met in the most beautiful way because you were doing what you love. That's right. And he was doing what he loves, mountain biking, right? That's right. That's how we met. He was very patient with me since I was never going down that road again. Um, but it, it has turned out to be a really good thing. So, yeah. So, um, so we spend a lot of time outdoors. We did a hundred mile bike ride yesterday. So we are outdoors a lot and, um, people are discovering that first of all, it's very hard to be cooped up in a house. Um, and in different parts of the country, the coronavirus has had very different impacts on people and whether they really are stuck inside or not. But, um, but definitely I, I'm seeing more and more people out walking, even if it's just around the neighborhood. And that's such a positive thing. I just, I can't, um, under, I can't overstate, I guess, how important it is just to get outdoors, whether it's in the woods or it's, just getting a, you know, taking a stroll around the block. I think people are, are feeling that. And I think, you know, it's only been in the last 100 years of our development as human beings that we've spent so much time indoors. 
and it's not natural. We're having all kinds of health problems and mental health problems from not getting outdoors enough, whether it's vitamin D or fresh air or lack of movement or whatever it is in our overprocessed lives, overprocessed food, our chemicals that we're bathing in and swimming in, and everything is so completely unnatural. Spending way too much time on screens and it's it's slowly killing us, as you and I both know. And I just hope that there's some kind of revelation during this COVID pandemic that that yes, that is true. And and we do need to live life more simply, whether it's growing our own food if we can and trying to avoid processed food and trying to reduce the chemical load in our food and on our bodies. And, or whether it's just getting outside and moving and smelling and it the be, trees. Right. And it can be done safely. I mean, I think a lot of people, which I found interesting, uh, maybe, maybe the first couple of weeks, most people were quarantined, depending where you were, were told to stay in, but we were, you know, we were still allowed to kind of go outside and yet people didn't choose to go outside as if you could almost catch it in just open air. Right. And, and I understand that fear. And now the question is, how do we incorporate safe use of masks or sh I use face shields. I use a face shield, which is clear and see-through yeah. and it's just wonderful to be able to walk with friends with right. a face shield, which I think is even more protective than a mask. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, there's really smart, clever ways to be safe and still participate on bike trails and on walking paths where people walk right. by you. Um, you know, and I think that's the question is how much that we learned or might have learned is something that we're going to actually make an effort to keep in our lives as we move forward once and hopefully that, you know, when jobs get back and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it's just a very interesting to see us all making these transitions from fear and hiding out to, you know, maybe we can do this safely, you know? Yes. And the, and the trick is to not go the other way and just say, we don't need masks. We don't need to socially distance. I'm seeing, unfortunately, quite a bit of that where I live right now. And unfortunately, with all of the unrest currently, I'm, I'm really worried. And that's the topic of another discussion. But right. Right. But I think we have, we have riots and, and other things going on at this time of our taping. You know, we're, we're hearing about all sorts of horrible stuff going on in the public and people close together with um, with peaceful gatherings as well as rioting. I mean, you know, in terms of um, racial unrest in this country. And, you know, the question is, is, you know, do people understand that the virus doesn't go away despite all our good intentions and uh -huh. you know whatever we're choosing to do to protest and be out there? we really want to be safe. You know, we want to be thinking about the spread of this virus, you know? Yeah. And, you know, on that note, it just brings to my mind this sense that our whole country and probably our whole world is in a state, in a collective state of grief. Don't you think it's, it's just, yeah. it's yeah. so much, it's so much to take in. It's so much to deal with between people contracting this terrible virus and dying and not being able to be with our loved ones in their final moments and losing jobs. And then this, this tension and unrest that we're seeing right now with the protests, um, you know, we're, we're all affected. We're all just deeply, I think, to the core affected by these things. I don't think there's anybody probably across the planet who isn't somehow affected by these things. Yeah. And then these are, and, and what you're describing your work, that's so pertinent now in terms of forest bathing and I, and you take patients out. I mean, you take groups out, you teach them, you know, how to do this forest bathing process. You even do tea ceremonies. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about what you do with your clients, your patients right. and, and these tea ceremonies, which you actually describe beautifully in your new book, which we'll talk about soon. All right. Thanks. So, um, so a little more about the history, um, in the United States, a man named Amos Clifford, who is my very good friend, um, brought the practice to the United States from Japan and created an organization called the association of nature and forest therapy, 
with the mission of training guides to take people out in this type of practice um, in a guided fashion, kind of like a yoga class. Like you don't just decide you're going to start being a yoga practitioner without a teacher or a guide. And it's a similar type of thing to be, to be guided and taught how to do this practice. And so the practice is a, a stepwise practice that's done in a standard sequence each time. Um, and so I became trained and certified as a forest therapy guide a while back and um, have served as the medical director for the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. So we now have about 800 guides. Pro well, it's probably more than that. It's constantly growing in about 48 different countries around the world. And so if people wow. are interested, they can actually go to the natureandforesttherapy.org website and find a guide in their area. So, so that's, uh, and right now, unfortunately, a number of these walks are being done virtually, but you know what, as we're finding with everything, you can do things virtually. You can even do a nature and forest therapy walk virtually in your own space with your own nature, listening to a guide. So that's been really kind of interesting and exciting to watch. So anyway, yes, I take um, participants out on these walks. They're typically a two to three hour walk and they, they go through a sequence of what we refer to as invitations that invite the participants to take nature in through the various senses in a systematic way with the goal of getting people out of their everyday crazy monkey mind state kind of deeper into almost like a meditative or dreamlike state uh, that we refer to as the liminal state. And so that's the goal of every forest therapy walk is to forest bathing walk. We use those uh, terms interchangeably, but to really get out of that crazy mindset and just into a more peaceful state. Uh, we typically then share some of what we've noticed with the group. Um, people can share as much or as little as they wish to share. And then typically a forest bathing walk is ended with a tea ceremony in the Japanese tradition. Uh, and so some guys will use dried tea from um, plants that they purchase if it's possible and safe. Sometimes we'll forage tea from uh, our plant from the area and make a tea right there. And so that's where the herbal medicine uh, comes into play. What I really enjoy doing is during our tea ceremony, sharing some of the herbal medicine that I've learned and practiced now over the years. And uh, I find that people really, really crave this information. I think we have this kind of deep, you know, our grandparents, our grandmothers used to know how to use herbs and plants as medicine and food. And uh, we've gotten so far away from that, that people seem to be genuinely shocked to learn that you can take this dandelion or this plantain or nettle or some of these, these weeds, you know, wild plants that we see on it all the time and, and realize that they actually have all kinds of medicinal properties. So, so we do, we end with a tea ceremony, um, give back to the land. And we talk about the ancestors of the land and all these beautiful things and, um, makes for a, pretty memorable experience. Typically I, I, I continue every time I, I guide people in forest bathing, I'm just blown away by what people share back with me. I've had people tell me that their chronic pain, that they have had no benefit, no resolution from any of any number of modalities for years and years and years will, will report that after two and a half hours of forest bathing, their, their joint pain is gone. I mean, this amazing. is amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. Like, but you all people you know about joy pain and your patients. Right, right. As a rheumatologist, I think we need to sign more up for this forest bathing because really it's this mind-body connection and our perception of pain um, can be so strong based on our mental stresses. I mean, we already know that that's true. You know, listen, if you don't get enough sleep the night before, we all know this from being parents, uh, for instance, or having a hard work job, you know, work issue, um, you know, the next day we perceive everything with greater pain levels. And so right. if Absolutely. you can help the mind, you know, quiet down, you can often heal a lot of what's going on in the body, which Absolutely. is amazing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. And I think a large part of it is the mind, but I also do believe that there are some, some real things that happen physically in nature, whether it's grounding, coming in contact with the ground, which we know has antioxidant properties to come in contact with 
the soil, right. um, you know, whether it's maybe breathing in these chemicals from the trees, it, it, we haven't yet quantified, you know, we haven't yet figured out all these mysteries of how nature is benefiting our health. But the experiences that I see time and time again are confirming that whatever it is, it happens and it works. Right. Even from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, when you think about just separating ourselves out from sort of it, from the man-made, woman-made, modern day living, as you described earlier, um, you know, it's almost more natural. Our genetic template almost craves this kind of quieted environment, right. this um, unsyn- non-synthetic environment. So, you know, I, um, I think most people would agree that they love being at the beach. They love being at, you know, someplace that ties them to, to water, to lakes, right. to forests, to greens. Um, and there's just so many, so many studies that are done, uh, as you mentioned, on mental health improvement, um, anxiety, yeah. depression with, with these changes of environment or, or adding them routinely into someone's life. Um, so tell me a little bit about with all of these you know, wonderful uh, tour guiding. And I swear, I would, if we live closer, we would have so much fun. Um, you're yeah. in Iowa and I'm in New Jersey, but, um, but we get together enough. I think I should take a virtual tour with you. Actually, that would be fun. But tell me a little bit about what your current projects are because you have yeah. a lot of exciting stuff you're doing and then also things coming up. And then we'll kind of tie it into the book that you, um, that you wrote, which is gorgeous. So go, go right ahead and tell me a little right. bit about either first. Yeah, well, um, some of the interesting projects we have going on, um, I, I'm, you know, excited and thrilled to work with a number of different physicians and researchers around the country and world who also have kind of a nature bent. Um, I've gotten to know some of them through an organization called Shift. Um, which if people are interested in that, we're holding our conference virtually, unfortunately, this year in October, October 14th through 16th. Um, but that's at shiftjh.org. Might as well share that because that is something that uh, for anybody who has interest in nature coming together from all the different disciplines that a person might come to. We have people who are hunters and fisher people, and we so have you don't people, have to be a you don't have to be a medical person. You don't have to be a medical okay. person. You just have to like nature. Oh, great. Um, people who are land managers, people who are in the outdoor industry. And then now we're starting to um, come together. I've become a board, board member of the organization, but really we've shifted the focus of the organization to nature as a social determinant of health. So really trying to figure out how nature can be a health benefit for everybody regardless of where you live. And there's a lot of focus right now on nearby nature and how can we, how can we benefit from the nature that's outside our window, especially in this time of COVID? Um, can you derive benefit from gazing out your window at a tree? Can you derive benefit from interacting with a house plant, from sitting on your porch or your balcony and being able to you know, look at a potted plant or at a vista maybe, or whatever it is, how does that confer health benefits? And right. Cause not everyone, that it does. Right. Not everyone lives. I mean, I, you know, just watching what went down in New York city, which is kind of closest to me and um, you know, looking at places around the world in Italy and in Spain, you know, not everyone lives in an environment where they have a balcony right. or even access to a park or, you know, even a forest. So, right. you know, looking to find those um, simple ways that even um, someone who lives in a, a small apartment right. can really gain benefit. I think that's brilliant because yeah. uh, it's real. Yeah. And it is real. You're absolutely right. And studies are finding it to be real. So, so I've been, uh, I've been involved in some of the studies and the writing about these kinds of things and the meeting and convening. Um, I'm also working on a project for continuing medical education for physicians that I'm really excited about working with Dr. Robert Czar, who is the founder of Park RX America, um, Dr. Kathy Wolf and Dr. Courtney Schultz, who are both researchers in the field of nat- nature, um, and working on a continuing medical medical education webinar that we're going to be done with very soon. We're really excited about it, uh, where physicians could actually gain continuing medical education from watching our webinar. We've incorporated a ton of research into it. Um, We've actually uh, added a little benefit for physicians in dealing with burnout and how this can help them as well. So um, we're really, really excited about it. So 
Yeah, we have all kinds of little projects. In yeah, and, and one day it will get into medical school and resident curriculum, right? Because really yeah. it's it's not just training the lay person, which is, you know, pretty much the whole community, but it's also teaching doctors to teach their patients yes. as part of a medical prescription, really. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that is actually another project that is just kind of getting started is this idea of perhaps even adding some curriculum related to nature into medical school and residency training. So yeah, stay tuned for all that. It's big medicine. It's big medicine and it's smart medicine. Um, so let me ask you another question. Um, so this book, tell me how you got involved in this beautiful book and it's through Falcon Guides and it's called The Outdoor Adventurer's Guide to Forest Bathing. Um, let me know because I have it in my hand and it's just, it's really just stunning. The pictures, the explanations, it's just gorgeous. So tell me a little bit about how you got into that project. Thank you. Well, um, life again takes its twists and turns and I guess it was 2018, the spring of 2018, I was contacted by Falcon Guides, one of the editors, um, asking me if I would write a book on forest bathing. And I said, I can't write the book on forest bathing. It's been written. Amos Clifford has a fantastic book on forest bathing. The doctors, Dr. Me Miyazaki and Dr. Lee in Japan have great books on forest bathing. The book is written. It's not my book to write. So this editor said, well, why don't we have a phone call and see, you know, if there's something there. And so we had a brainstorming phone call and he asked me what I, what I was into and kind of all the things that we've talked about today. And I shared with him a little bit about, um, how I came to forest bathing, the adventure, the mind body practice, the herbal medicine and all of that. And he said, I think that's the book right there, incorporating all of those things. And so, so that's really what the book is. It's, it's written for some, but it's written for so many different people. It's written for the outdoor adventurer who either trail runs or hikes or mountain bikes or cross country skis or climbs or, you know, all of these different kinds of activities that I enjoy doing, but it's also written for somebody who does none of those things. You don't have to be an outdoor active enthusiast in any way to be able to enjoy the book. But I wrote um, different invitations that a person could do before, during, or after any of those activities, or just any time, just going out in nature. Um, it's also available in audiobook, which I think could be helpful for somebody who wants to listen to it as they're sitting outside. Kind of some of them could be kind of a meditative invitation to use as you're sitting outdoors in nature. Um, I incorporated science about the studies of why this makes sense for us, why nature has health benefits, and then um, included a number of herbal medicine kinds of things, how to, you know, tea plants, what, how these things that we see and can easily identify could actually be used to create a tea or just for your knowledge that, believe it or not, there are all these health benefits of these simple things that you can probably recognize. So yeah, it just all kind of came together. It was so much fun to write because it was all the things that I love and it just spewed out and there it was. It was a book. Sounds so organic. I mean, the idea that your passion became your career is such a blessing, really, because how many people get that? And I think your words in the beginning about letting it find you, your niche found you, um, and it's made you, I, I mean, just as a, a friend and an observer, such a more open, um, you know, incredible practitioner. Um, when physicians uh, or any person, but in, in medicine, when a, when a healthcare professional is happy, um, it shows in the way they heal in terms of how they educate their patients. And I've just seen this amazing transition since the first time I met you, I mean, which was you know, such a tough time to now. And, you know, I just couldn't be happier for you. I think it's just wonderful what you're doing and how you're educating everyone. Thank so, you. so tell me, Suzanne, tell our audience, I should say, because I already <laughs> know how to get in touch with you. Um, how should our audience members, if they want to get in touch with you for any reason at all, I guess you can tell them what reasons, um, but <laughs> how, how can they get in touch with you? Because um, I'm sure there's going to be people interested in, in getting to know you or finding out what services you could help them with. Well, I would love that. And I can be reached probably most easily via my website, which is 
integrativeinitiative.com. Lots of eyes in there, I realized after the fact, but integrativeinitiative.com, um, there's contact information, a number of the articles I've written, um, media stuff is on there, all kinds of interesting things. I'll put a link to this on there as soon as it's available. Sure. And on, are you also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those good uh, yeah, social media um, sites? Um, I'm on Facebook at Integrative Initiative also. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I have way too many handles. So I'm uh, Nature Doc Susie, S-U-Z-Y, on Twitter. So yeah. Okay, and that's Doc awesome. Susie on Instagram. Come and yeah, see me. Join me anywhere. And we'll, we're going to have this on our link, uh, you know, on our, our, our Facebook page and wherever we put this up on the Smart Human. Cool. And um, we'll make sure people can reach you. And also, your book is available in, uh, in stores, but also, of course, online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the other stores that you can buy from. Um, I got to tell you, it's been really nice hanging out with you. Um, some stuff I didn't know, um, some stuff I did, but I got to tell you, it's just so easy to talk to you. And, um, and I'm thrilled that you could be my very first guest on the Smart Human Podcast. So I am um, honored to be your first guest on the Smart Human Podcast. This is I so figured fun. you're my good friend. You wouldn't judge if we screwed up. So I'm so <laughs> thrilled um, that you could be my first guest. And, um, and I look forward to all the other things that you create in the future, um, other books and other projects. And, um, so it's just been a real pleasure. So thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne Bartlett Hackenmiller, uh, MD. And, um, it was just a pleasure having you. It was my pleasure, Ailey. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. I love that we get to celebrate our little, um, you know, celebrations together on a regular basis as only we could do with each other. It makes I know. my day. I say you're the only one who will understand. So this is great. Likewise. So thanks for being my friend as well as everything else. So thanks, Suzanne. And uh, we'll Thank connect you. soon in person. Okay. Sounds good. Later. Bye. <laughs>